the programming for the the game logic, uh, like the, the the rules for the um, for the scenario of the hostage rescue scenario. Uh, because the game was uh, a modification of Half-Life, I didn't have to do a lot of other programming. So, uh, like all of the networking, all of the graphic rendering and stuff, that was all done uh, by Half-Life. So that that's one of the advantages of, of making a mod of, of a game. You, you kind of like save yourself a lot of, of um, uh, low low level grunt work. So, um, so yeah, as as you can see, the graphics were terrible, and uh, the first version only had uh, a, a very very basic. Uh, subset of, of what was uh, to become the full version of Counter-Strike. Uh, there was only like six guns and there was only two maps and uh, there was only like two characters and as you can sort of see the characters, they looked very similar to each other so uh, I was getting, I remember the very first version we got a lot of complaints from players saying that they looked too close to, to each other, I, I, you know, they, we couldn't tell them apart so uh, they always ended up shooting each other so that was a big problem. So. Um, so. <laughs> So as you can sort of see in the in the uh, the the far right, there's a that was kind of like my my idea for a new terrorist. And uh, when I first released that picture, uh, a lot of players were like, "Oh my God, that is so ugly!" And <laughs> and they they laughed at me really really hard. And I, I was like, "Oh my God, uh, I can't release this. This is too bad," you know, because uh, players were, were were just making fun of it. They were saying it looked like Luke Skywalker. <laughs> so. <yeah. laughs> So uh, yeah, I mean, so I remember. I, so I guess a lot of people never ever saw this because it's it was an unreleased character. But uh, uh, so now, you, so now you see it now. So um, so yeah, th thankfully I didn't release that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, over the course of two years, we uh, released a, a new version of Counter Strike about once every uh, three months, and uh, around the uh, the fifth version that we released, we were contacted by Valve. And they were really interested in the game because uh, at the time, uh, the popularity of Counter-Strike was, was just kind of skyrocketing. And uh, at about the time they contacted us, they, they said, oh, uh, you know, we really like what you guys did and we'd, we'd like to you know, purchase the, the, the game and you know, hire you guys to make it, uh, continue developing it. And you know, at the time, we were just 21 years old and uh, we, had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of student debt. And we were like, yeah, OK, sure. Uh, we didn't really think about it, right? Because uh, we just we just thought that it was a free game. We didn't think we'd ever make money from Counter Strike. You know, it's thinking back on it, I, I realized how kind of uh, immature we were uh, in terms of like our business thought. We were just we were just 21 years old, and we just like we, we were broke. We were like poor, and we just like we, we, if someone threw money at us, we'd just be like, yes, yes, give us money. <laughs> and we didn't realize how much Counter Strike was worth. So. Uh, so at the time we just said, yeah, okay, we'll we'll, we'll sign. So then, uh, so then that was that was that, and we we just sort of sold the rights to Counter Strike, and uh, we worked with Valve for about uh, four or five years, and it was a good relationship. I enjoyed working there, and uh, I learned a lot, and uh, it's something that I I don't regret uh, doing because uh, it was it was such a good experience for me. So, yeah, even though I wish I would have asked for more, but <laughs> that's that's the past. You know, we all make mistakes. Um, uh, so at the time of CS's development, uh, the team was like really just two people. Uh, like it was just it was a very so small game. It didn't really contain a lot of uh, uh, graphics, and the the programming was very simple. Uh, it was just uh, myself, and I also had a partner uh, called Jess, who was uh, responsible for uh, the website uh, maintenance and also community management, which was a huge part of the success of Counter-Strike. Because all of the levels in Counter-Strike, they were made by our community. And uh, we would get like, uh, every week we would get like 100 new levels submitted to us. And it was a lot of work uh, for Cliffy to uh, just kind of like uh, look at the levels and evaluate them and just sort of see which ones uh, we could uh, uh, include in our next version. And uh, so yeah, it was just, uh, it was a massive undertaking. And, and that's kind of how, but, but 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 that's kind of how the game grew so fast because of the the the, the input from the community and uh, if we didn't have that 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 link with the community I don't think Counter Strike would have grown uh, as fast as it did and uh, you know we may have we may not have been as successful so uh, so yeah. Uh, next. So uh, some of the lessons that I learned from uh, working on Counter Strike was that. Uh, Getting the community involved early was probably the most uh, important thing for us and was probably the biggest reason it, it grew so fast. Uh, having the tool set 
uh, as easy to use for the community was also a big, uh, a big uh, issue for us because uh, at the time we didn't have really good tools, in fact, and they weren't really well documented. So we, also, we spent a lot of time just telling our, our level designers how to use the tools and looking back on it, I realized how much time we wasted. So I think it was really, really important for us to, if we were gonna do it again, it's really important to really focus on, on having a really, really simple tool set for the, for the developers. And uh, also, uh, having to uh, deal with community feedback, like we would get a lot of complaints and we would get a lot of suggestions on how to improve the game. And it was really hard for us to kind of like read all of them and kind of uh, try to figure out, okay, how should we uh, take this feedback and put it into our game? Because uh, like player feedback generally is really not, you know, it's not really that helpful. Uh, it, it's, it's really kind of like, like most of the feedback we would get would be like, uh, I can't aim, can you fix the aiming? Or, uh, or stuff like, the game is unbalanced. So it was very, very just general stuff. And we had to kind of like read between the lines, okay, so what, what does he mean, you know? Because they're, they're not very good at being specific. So, you know, uh, so that was, a big, uh, that was a big challenge for us. And uh, eventually we kind of got better at it though. So, uh, so that's, that's one thing that I kind of uh, improved on as I, as I kind of grew. Uh, and also another uh, big thing that we kind of lacked when we were developing Counter-Strike was uh, we didn't have a really good test environment. Uh, when you uh, develop a game, especially uh, like a multiplayer game that involves a lot of different players, it's important to have uh, like uh, an environment in which you can test your, your code before you release it. And we, we didn't have that. I mean, we were so amateur that we just have like two people. Before we release a version, we would just test it with me and, and, uh, and Cliffy. And like, if it, if it didn't have any bugs, we said, okay, yeah, let's release. But you know, that's, I mean, like, obviously looking back on that, you know, it's, it was so ridiculous because every time we release, uh, we would get like uh, instant uh, bug reports. You know, like, it was just like, oh my God, this is broke. How can we release this, you know? So uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's the one thing that I regret not having was just a proper environment where we can test the game fully with like 20 players that we needed to, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the next slide. Um, so yeah, the, some of the interesting things about Counter-Strike uh, like that happened over the course of its development was uh, one of the most popular maps was DE Dust. And uh, I remember when it first was submitted to us, I said, this is ugly, I, I, I hate this, I'm not gonna put this in our game. And, <laughs> and I was like, I had to argue with uh, my partner and also the level designer and they kept they kept pleading, come on, please, please put it in the game. And then eventually after about a month, I said, okay, fine, put it in the game, but I don't think it's gonna be a, a success. And then, I don't know if you guys know, but this is the most successful map in Counter-Strike's history. So uh, yeah, that was just one of those interesting facts that uh, I almost kind of sabotaged the success of Counter-Strike by, by, not, by not putting that map in the game. So yeah, Inter interesting to know. Um, so an another thing that uh, was really, uh, that we got a lot of feedback from was every time we released a new version, our players would complain about uh, things that we didn't even change. So like one of the big things that they would complain about was this new version is, is, is more like, it has more lag than the last version. What did you guys do? And we'd be like, we didn't touch anything. What the heck are you talking about? Because it, like we, we, no matter how much we explained to them, uh, they would always complain. Every version is, like, this is worse than the last version. Change it, change it back, please. And then we were like, you know, one, ver one time I just got so fed up that the next version we released, I would just artificially subtract people's pings like by, by negative 50. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so if like their actual ping was 100, I just say, okay, 50, just say it's 50. <laughs> and then, and then a lot of the players were like, oh my God, what did you do? This is incredible. And like, <laughs> So I mean, it just goes to prove that these people, the, the people that complain, they have no idea what they're talking about. They don't have a, like, they're not doing this scientifically. They're just doing this based on how they feel. So, you know, it's like, how can you, so it just kind of proved to me that player, player uh, uh, feedback is, is something that you really have to, you know, kind of like, uh, just kind of, um, you know, filter out and try to read between the lines. So, uh, but one of the funny things was that, that, that little, the uh, thing that I did by subtracting 50 was I didn't check for negative values. So, <laughs> so some players were getting like negative 20 ping and people were like, what the heck's going on, you know? And I was like, I was like oh my God, this guy's from the future. You know, he's playing, he's playing from the future. <laughs> so, yeah. 
that was that was really that was a funny moment that uh, we uh, we kind of got caught because we we're like oh well, you know uh, we have to admit that oh okay we, we we did something bad we actually did subtract fifty <laughs> but anyways that didn't last long so anyways but uh, it was just an interesting part of uh, the uh, the learning experience so yeah so um, uh, let's see so. Okay. Um, so. Okay. So, anyways, uh, so CS development was was yeah, you know, it was a big, it was a big highlight of my career. And when I look back on it, I was like, whoa, my math is bad here. <laughs> okay. 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 Whatever. Okay. 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 Whatever. You know, I did this. I did this last night, and I was like, you know, I was. I'm still jet lag because I, I came from Canada. I was like, oh my god, I'm not thinking. So I apologize. That's that's supposed to be five percent teamwork, hard work. Because really, when I look back at CS. You know, it wasn't a lot of, you know, it wasn't something that we did was so much better than the competitors. I, when I look at it, I don't think it was a terribly great game, but I just think it came out at the right time. And, you know, that's, that's the 95% that's the luck part. It just came out at a time where nobody made a game like that. And, you know, uh, we, didn't, we didn't anticipate that. We didn't, we didn't look at the, the, the industry and say, okay, this, this industry needs a game like this. Let's make this. No, I just made this game because, you know, it was just fun. And for me, it was fun and I wanted to do it. So that's where I got lucky. And, you know, uh, for me to do it again, I don't think it's ever going to happen. You know, I mean, I don't think I'll ever have a hit like Counter-Strike. And uh, this is something that uh, a lot of uh, other game developers you know, uh, I, I look at them and I said, you know, wow, you guys got lucky with that one as well. So, some like some examples of uh, of other like big hits that I I feel that kind of really got lucky were like like Minecraft. You know, I mean, it's a great game. I mean, I'm not I'm not knocking it. I'm not saying this is a game that didn't require hard work. It, it, you know, these types of games where you know nobody knew that this was going to be a big hit, but you know, it's basically like Lego. It's virtual Lego, basically, right? So. Uh, and at the time when it came out, it, there was nothing like it. So, uh, so they, that, that was, that's one example. And uh, another recent example was DayZ, which uh, I, will, I will say it's, it's a really awesome game, and it has really, really, uh, really interesting gameplay. But I feel that it just came out. You know, it was, I think a lot of it was kind of lucky. It just blew up because there was nothing quite like it. You know, and. Uh, you know, I mean, I think you guys know what this is, right? You know, I mean, if you talk to the guy who made this, he's probably not going to say, yeah, this, this, I spent like freaking years doing this game. <laughs> no, man. I, you know, honestly, I, I, I'm not saying he's he's terrible uh, developer, but, you know, I think he got lucky, you know? I mean, if, if someone else tried to do this, like maybe from 10 years from now, if someone tried to do Flappy Birds, exact same thing, it's not going to be a hit. Or maybe if they tried to do it 10 years ago, I don't think it's going to be hit, but you know th these kind of things. You know, you never know. You know, society is just weird like that. You know, and they're like this one's another one. <laughs> so you know, I mean, it's not a game, but you know, like it's just you, you think you look at this kind of music, and it's like, could, could this like if you did this ten years ago, it wouldn't have blown up, right? I mean, it's a good song, but I'm not saying it's uh, it's a great song, but you know, there's very many songs similar to it that, that that didn't blow up. So so when you look at a lot of big hits out there, uh, you have to understand that. Uh, a lot of it is just luck, you know. I I, I don't think uh, all these people who did these hits were were like masterminds and geniuses, because uh, you know, uh, you know, I just that's just my opinion. But anyways, so yeah, so the biggest challenge in today's industry with with regards to the game industry is that uh, as as a game developer, you know, you wanna you wanna succeed, you wanna make some money out there. But it's a huge challenge because when you look at the game industry now, every day there's like new games uh, on on the Steam store and on the on the iTunes store, there's like a hundred new games every day. So so it's a big challenge for for game developers to to really uh, <clears throat> to really find a find a niche that that kind of like they can uh, succeed in. And uh, it's not it wasn't like this ten years ago though because uh, ten years ago we we would we, we didn't have a hundred games every day. It was just more like one game every like every day. So you know it was it was much more. Uh, feasible to to actually survive so uh, so it's a big challenge and it, it's something that I that I that I uh, kind of think about with a lot of my 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 my, my friends and we, we kind of trying to we, we we don't know there's no solution to it though I don't know think <laughs> yeah but um, um, so, um so yeah I mean uh, in order to uh, make a, a successful game I think it's important to kind of look at uh, the industry uh, like the history of the industry over the past 25 years so uh, so this is uh, just talking about how games have evolved through uh, the past 25 years. Um, so in 1999 and 2000, uh, the most popular uh, genres were like the RTS genre and the MMO genre. 
And also the FPS genre uh, started to become very popular as well. Uh, so these three, three genres were very, very big at the time. And also uh, during this time, you were we were seeing uh, kind of the death of uh, adventure games like uh, King's Quest, Police Quest. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you guys are familiar with these games, but they're kind of like these text-based, no, not text-based, but they're kind of like you move your mouse over and the character kind of, um, they're adventure games anyways, you can look them up. <laughs> um, and also uh, simulation games. Uh, th these are really, really difficult technical games that uh, at the time they were popular during the 1990s, but during the end of the 90s, we were seeing far less of them, and it was kind of a shame because I was a big fan of these simulation games, but they weren't really easy for, for casual players to learn because they, they, they took a lot of time to just to get into the game and just to really enjoy it. So, so yeah, we were seeing uh, the death of these two genres. And over to the next decade, we started to see like FPS games just become huge. Like I, I think this this decade was the was the golden age of FPSs, and we saw like Call of Duty and Battlefield just really, really just make a huge impact on the industry. Uh, also, we were seeing the kind of like the peak of MMOs. I would I would say kind of like a World of Warcraft it was starting to become uh, pretty popular, but I think it's kind of dying out at that at this certain age as well. As well as RTS games, uh, we didn't see as many of them as at that time, but, um, uh, and also the emergence of MOBA. This was kind of the decade where we saw League of Legends and Dota kind of just uh, come out of nowhere and just kind of take the industry by storm. And, and here we are now where we have like just kind of MOBA madness, I would say, because um, everywhere you look, everyone's just trying to emulate Dota and trying to emulate the success of it. But as you can sort of uh, tell that not a lot of them are having a lot of uh, success. Like just uh, recently, this one called Dawngate, it's actually being published by EA, but uh, they just actually stopped service because they realized that they couldn't compete with uh, League of Legends and Dota. So uh, it's a very, very competitive uh, industry. Uh, so yeah, also we're seeing uh, the, uh, the emergence of sandbox games like Gary's Mod and Minecraft and Daisy. <coughs> Uh, so yeah, and also we're also seeing kind of like the reemergence of of some genres that died two decades ago. Like, where, like simulation games are kind of coming back, but they're becoming more casual. So they're 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 changing their ways and they're kind of learning from the failures of the past decade. Uh, and as well as adventure games as well, we're starting to see kind of like the emergence of uh, like new adventure games, uh, like the the ones from Telltale. So it's kind of interesting that you know you you can never really predict how the genre how the game industry will, will evolve in the next decade. So one of the things with regards to g making games is when, when, when usually, when people ask me what kind of game I should make or what kind of game that they should make, I always tell them, you know, you should really pay attention to pop culture. What is, what is popular right now? And uh, you can use that as a barometer as what kind of game that you should make. And that will really, really help you out in terms of uh, having your game appeal to a broad audience. Because if your game appeals to a broader audience, there's a much a greater chance of it uh, making a financial success. It's kind of limiting though, because you know you don't want to be like, oh, you know, I got to make another like, uh, you know, game like Game of Thrones or like something like that. But you know, it, it's like if you want to be easy, if you want to make it easier and stuff, it, it really, really helps to kind of pay attention to what what is what is fashionable now. You know, so like uh, when, when, for example, there was like a decade ago, there was like a lot of World War II games and. And I, I thought that they kind of rode on the success of game, movies like Saving Private Ryan and that kind of thing. Uh, and also, like, Lord of the Rings kind of spawned the success of, uh, you know, games that were based on fantasy. So, so yeah, it really helps to kind of use uh, pop culture as a kind of a uh, barometer for, for what kind of uh, theme that your game should have. Um, but that's not to say that, like... Uh, as, as game developers, we should shy away from innovative games because when you look at the, 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 the last uh, tw two decades, all of the innovative games that ever came out were, were actually made by indie developers. And the thing is, uh, indie developers take more chances, they take more risks because uh, big publishers like EA and Activision, they don't look at, they, they look at these, these games like these and they just say, well, this is a big risk. They're, you know, there's a huge chance that it's not gonna make money. So they won't even bother pursuing these games. But, but it's important that uh, I think uh, people uh, who are uh, amateurs, that they actually do like, look at pursuing these games because if they didn't, then we wouldn't have such huge genres like this. So um, I, I think most of the innovation does come from the indie, indie, uh, indie scene. Uh, so now I'd like to just talk about like, the, the revenue growth of the game industry over the past uh, two decades. Um, so this slide. 
So as you can sort of see in this slide, um, from 1995 to 2015, the revenue actually increased pretty, pretty uh, dramatically, actually. You saw a really sharp spike, and it's kind of indicative of how the industry is kind of growing in, in, a, in a, uh, just, you know, in monetary-wise terms, that we're starting to see more and more gamers come out. And this is kind of a chart showing, like, uh, the different platforms, how, how they're kind of growing. And as you can sort of see, uh, the mobile market is really, really just skyrocketing. And, I, I mean, eventually it's probably going to overtake the PC, obviously. But it's got a long ways to go before it hits, uh, reaches the console, um, the, the level of console gaming. So... So as you can sort of see from the previous uh, uh, slides, the, uh, the, the revenue f uh, of the industry has grown three times in the past uh, 25 years. But the number of developers has grown, like, I would say more than, like, maybe 20 times. I would say, like, more, even, like, 50 times. We're seeing way more developers than there were back in 1995. So, so the problem is, like, how do we, like, how do we, in, as an industry, uh, how are we able to survive, you know, because, you know, we're not, there's not enough money to go around, you know, unless we all take pay cuts, <laughs> but that's not going to happen. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, so, you know, um, so, so uh, you're starting to see a lot of different uh, uh, changes in the industry to, to accommodate this, this kind of like imbalance in the growth of the industry. Like we don't have as much revenue as we do uh, the developers. So, so, you, so one of the changes that we're starting to see is, is the, the, uh, the introduction of free-to-play. And this was a mechanism that was actually, it, it was born out of, uh, uh, out of Asia, actually, because uh, in Asia, as, as some of you may, may know, that uh, piracy is a huge problem. And in fact, I think 99% of the games in Asia are pirated. Like, there's a very, very low percentage of people who actually buy games in Asia. So the, the Asian game uh, developers, they came up with, a, a, they came up with this solution that they would make their game free and they would uh, uh, generate revenue by, by selling uh, items within the game. So it was kind of a very, very interesting uh, method. And, and as you can sort of see, it's really, really taken off because you're starting to see it kind of encroach on the Western uh, industries. We're starting to see a lot of games in the West use this method. And, and also uh, mobile games uh, almost exclusively are free to play. So um, that's really, really kind of, it's taken off in that regard. So. So one of the main attractions is it kind of nullifies piracy. Like, if your game is free to play, it's never going to be pirated. It's free. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but you also have to change the way you think of your game. It's, it's not a product. It's, it's a service. So like, you can't just release the game and then not worry about it and then walk away and hopefully it makes money for you. You actually have to release it and then constantly maintain it. So, so it's, a big, uh, it's a big change in the way uh, game developers have to operate. And it, it, it changes like just the whole infrastructure of, of your company in that sense. Um, uh, also, another, uh, another good thing about free-to-play is it also uh, allows your, uh, the game to incorporate advertisements from, from different industries. Like, so you can, you can put in ads from cars and that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, that kind of thing, you could, you could, really, you can, you could still do it in the, uh, the, the non-free-to-play uh, games, but it kind of works better with, with free-to-play model because people understand that this is a game I'm get playing for free, so I don't mind watching the commercials. So, so yeah, that's, that's one aspect of free-to-play. So, I mean, if you decide to make a free-to-play game, there's a few guidelines that you have to be uh, kind of be aware of in order to make it successful. Um, so all free-to-play games, when you when you make them, you have to give the player access to the entire game right away. Like you, I mean, it's it's in order for the game to be successful, uh, the the gamer has to have like basically 80% of the entire game experience right right in front of them. Because if you if you kind of hide away a lot of your game experience, the gamers they won't uh, they won't get to see it before they leave. Because I think the average play time for a free-to-play gamer is like. Uh, like 30 minutes or something, 20 minutes. And if they're not hooked in 20 minutes, they're going to uninstall the game and leave. They'll never come back. It doesn't matter if you make an update or, or do anything. So as, as a developer, you have to make sure your game is instantly, uh, instantly uh, attractive to the gamers within like 20 minutes. So, so one, of the, one, of like, uh, one of the things is important is like, you have to make it really easy for them for the first 20 minutes. Like, your game can be very complicated, like League of Legends or like World of Tanks. But 
the usually the first uh, new players who install the game they're they're introduced through like tutorials and uh, the very first missions are really easy and they get they get money very easily so it's that it's that that it's that level of ease that makes the game attractive for new players and it kind of uh, it kind of uh, reduces their chances of leaving so soon um, another important thing with a free to play game is you have to make the game experience last long like you can't have a game the game end after like 20 hours or 30 hours uh, that, that's 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 a big uh, no-no because in order for free-to-play games to work, you have to keep them around long enough for them to want to pay money. And I think I was uh, reading somewhere that the average time that a free-to-play gamer spends on the game uh, has to play the game before he spends money. I think it's like a hundred hours. So I mean that's a long time <laughs> before they actually open their wallets because free-to-play gamers are notoriously cheap. You know, I mean they're like, you know, I'm not going to pay money. You know, I, I got this for free. So you have to like kind of trick them into like just playing longer and just yeah make the experience kind of uh, more worthwhile for them. Um, so another thing is uh, like you have to be uh, aware of making the game too pay to win because a lot of players they don't like they don't like it when the game sells items that make, puts them at advantage over other games. That's a that's also a big no no. So it's, um, yeah. Um, so one one of the things about free to play games is people don't realize but uh, only. If, uh, on average, only five percent of the people who play the free-to-play game are, spend money. Like the other ninety-five percent, they don't they don't spend a dime. So it's really important to uh, to really uh, try to increase that uh, convert. It's called a conversion rate. So, like in order for your game to be successful, you need to at least have a five percent conversion rate. Anything below that, then usually the game just shuts down. They just said, okay, you know, we're not making money. We'll shut it down. So that's that's kind of what happened to Planet Dawn, and it happens to you see a lot of free-to-play games uh, just shut down because of this. You know, they they just they're just not ha earning enough revenue. So uh, to give you some examples of other games that earn a lot, uh, League of Legends has like a 15% conversion rate. Uh, that means like 15% of the players who play it are actually buying stuff. Uh, World of Tanks has a really high one; it's like 25%. Uh, so part of that is because World of Tanks they sell uh, they sell stuff that really affects the uh, uh, player's performance. Uh, so yeah. So the more you sell items that have a, a, an effect on performance, the more conversion rate it is. But at, at the same time, the more risk that you're going to piss off players and you're going to have players leave your game. So it, it's kind of a fine balance. Yeah. Uh, so some of the limitations of free-to-play game is uh, they don't work well. Uh, you know, in my opinion, they don't work well for games that take place in reality because. Uh, I think free-to-play games in general, they have to sell cosmetics and they have to sell visual items that change the look of the player. And generally, when you when your when your game is based in reality, there's a there's a there's not there's not a lot of things that you can sell. You know, you can't sell pink uh, pink hats and stuff like that before before it looks ridiculous. You know, so uh, it's important that uh, if you're a free-to-play game, you have to have it so you you don't it's kind of you you don't have any limitations on on the the visual item that you can sell. Like for example, good good examples are like uh, Team Fortress 2 and League of Legends and those types of games. They're based in fantasy, so you can you can make up as many items as you can. Uh, so another uh, limitation is uh, free-to-play games generally don't work with single-player games. Like you, there's not a lot of single-player games out there that are free-to-play. Uh, I can't really think of any. I mean, there's some on the mobile, like Candy Crush. But uh, Candy Crush is a special case because uh, Candy Crush is able to introduce new uh, elements, like new levels, and they, they can actually uh, increase the, the play time uh, quite easily by adding new levels. And it's not hard for them to add new levels. But for a game like, uh, like uh, Batman or Skyrim, for them to add more content to prolong the game uh, experience, it, it costs a lot of money. So it, it's, not, it's, not very, uh, it's not very cost uh, were uh, cost benefit for them to to make it a free to play game. So, so in general, I don't think you we, we see a lot of free to play games on the PC side because of that. Uh, so another limitation of free to play games is it requires a minimum am amount of players. Like you can't have like just 100 players playing your game. Uh, it, it's just not it won't generate as much rev enough revenue. Like I think the base number of players that you need for like a PC game uh, for a free to play PC game is is around like. I would say around 5,000 uh, players uh, at any given time. So, so that's a big number. C like compared to non-free-to-play games, you can have like a successful non-free-to-play game with maybe like maybe 500 players, and that, you know that's fine. Uh, so it, it works. It's a different uh, limit. It's a, a different requirement for for those those types of games. So yeah. 
Um, so, uh, so as a as a game developer, we're always uh, kind of presented with three options when we make a game. Like, oh, should we make it for the PC or for the console or, or for the mobile game? And you have to really target your audience if you decide to make it for the PC because uh, each each uh, platform has has a very different audience and they have very different expectations. And I always find that with PC players, they kind of uh, they, they they kind of prefer games that have a more deep, complex uh, experience. Uh, so, for example, SimCity, Football Manager, but they also have uh, kind of gamers that also prefer something more casual, like uh, Team Fortress 2. But when you look at the console gamers, you would never see them play like a game like SimCity or Football Manager, because uh, console gamers tend to be more, uh, I guess I would say, younger, and they prefer something more uh, uh, fast-paced and not as deep as, as those types of games. So you can sort of see what they prefer over there, like Call of Duty, Halo, Grand Theft Auto, and God of War. Uh, and when it comes to mobile games, they come, they're a very, very diverse group of players, and th it's very hard to target them because they, 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 their tastes kind of range from like very casual games to very complex games. But I think the majority of casual players, they prefer games that last for like five minutes, five to ten minutes, and something that you can play and put down, and you know. So yeah, Angry Birds and Flappy, Flappy thingy. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, so one of the challenges when making mobile games as as a developer is, is uh, because every day there's like a thousand games on the on the store, and you 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 know as a gamer you want to be on the top ten, right? So one of the things that a lot of game developers do is they they have a way of uh, of, of cheating the system. In fact, by by actually writing fake reviews. And uh, like one example is uh, you can actually purchase uh, 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 some people in China that will actually write reviews for your game and. It costs like one dollar per review, and it's very, very, it's very interesting because it, it seems like, wow, that's so dishonest, you know. But this is kind of the way. This is the the evolution of the industry that it, it's gone to the point that the mobile industry is so saturated that you have to cheat in order to get to the top ten. Like, even if your game is really good and you think, oh, it's gonna go viral, don't worry about it, people are gonna play it. No, man. Like, I've seen great games that just never, never get noticed and never get played because they didn't hire this Chinese girl to, to do the reviews, you know? <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, I don't know if people are aware of this, but this, this is a real, real, real truth. Because uh, I know, because I worked at a company uh, and we actually hired this, this Chinese person. Not, not this one in particular, but <laughs> not people like them. And it, it's kind of interesting seeing that, you know, it's like, you know, and it costs like $1 per review and it's, it's just, it's very weird, you know? You know? So, I mean, the, like, not only do you have to make a good game, but you have to actually pay money to, to do the marketing. So it's, it's really important, especially with the mobile. Yeah. So um, some guidelines just uh, from, uh, for in terms of game design. When, whenever you design a game, um, it's important to, uh, to design the game so you, develop, you, you get feedback from your, uh, from your players as soon as possible. Uh, so I generally, with Counter-Strike, we, we release the ver first version uh, as quickly as we can, and then uh, we would get feedback every two months. And that, that really helped us to generate, uh, like, uh, to, to just discover bugs and just really change the game's uh, uh, direction on a, on, a, like, on a really quick schedule. Uh, so another aspect is, uh, when you design your game, it's really important to nail down the core aspect of your game first and then focus all of your, uh, your, your research on developing the core game first. Uh, because I see a lot of game developers, they spend time on, on aspects that don't really, uh, aren't important to the core game, and, and, and they kind of develop that part first, and they spend time, and then they realize, oh wait, the core game is not fun, maybe, you know, uh, we, just, we just wasted like two years uh, developing all these pretty graphics, when we should have just made the, the core game fun and then decide if we wanted to in iterate on that. So, so it's really important as, as a developer, we, we, we try to focus on making, identifying what your core game mechanic is and just making sure that part is fun. And you know, I've seen game developers spend like 80% of their time just doing the core game first. And then the rest of it is actually really just trivial. Just, you're just adding like pretty graphics. And uh, yeah, that's, it's not hard at all. So. So I think that pretty much concludes my talk. Um, I just want to thank you guys for coming out. And um, I hope you guys found that kind of informative. And um, I think now we're just going to be taking some uh, questions. If any of you guys had any questions with regards to uh, this presentation or just anything in general, I'm, yeah, I'm going to be here.
Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, so, good afternoon. Um, hello. Russ. Oh, sorry. Hi. Yeah. 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 Hi. Um, hello. Uh, hi. Thank you for uh, for coming. Uh, first of all. Oh, you're welcome. Um, um, my question is um, about those reviews on applications. Mm -hmm. um, how much do you think, or how many reviews are necessary on average for an application to get started? Oh, um, this is a tough one. Uh, it, it gets higher as uh, more as you see more games being on the. Because I think when we when we when we hired that person, we only needed to do about uh, I think like five thousand fake reviews. So uh, <laughs> so yeah, I mean you, it's it's considerable. It's a considerable amount. Because when you look at the the iTunes store, their top ten generally has at least like um, God, I don't know how much. But it's quite a lot. It's quite a lot, yeah. So I mean, uh, just to give you an idea of how much the marketing we had to spend, it was like around ten thousand uh, dollars just just for the uh, just to to get the the reviews on there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The more the better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Um, I could see from the. Um, what I was reading about Counter Strike from the mod, mm -hmm. that it was not open source in the beginning. Yes, no, it wasn't. It uh, was free, but not, uh, uh, just let me continue, please. So, yeah. the question is how did you get the community to contribute with the maps and everything else for a project that was not open source? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Well, it wasn't open source in the sense that we didn't release the source code for the game, but we did release the, uh, the tools that allow the mappers to make the levels. And that's really all they needed. And yeah, but uh, with regard to the source code, yeah, we didn't release that. And uh, we didn't think it was necessary, though, because we didn't want people to make different versions of Counter-Strike at the time, because we thought that it would like uh, splinter the community. And it, it, that we, that's not very good, because for the community to grow, you, you want to keep them on the same, like just one game. Uh, it, it's, it's important for the game to kind of evolve that way, we, we felt, yeah. OK, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <clears throat> Uh, okay, uh, first of all, I want to say a great presentation. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I have a question about Counter-Strike. Um, it is a game when, uh, where there are two teams with different objectives. How can you balance that? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, you know, with regards to the hostage scenario, that wasn't as popular because, as you mentioned, it's the two teams have different objectives. And we weren't really able to make that as balanced as the bomb scenario. The bombing scenario, we were able to make that pretty balanced. Because uh, when you look at the bomb scenario, it, it kind of it works kind of like capture the flag. So as long as you place the bomb spots in in the correct locations, you can make it very balanced for both teams. So it was it was it was kind of easy for the bomb scenario. But yeah, as you as you kind of allude to with the hostage scenario, we had a bit of trouble making it balanced, and and that's one of the reasons why you don't see many hostage rescue maps on, on esports because it, it's generally they're not as balanced as the bomb ones. Uh, but uh, just an add-up, uh, do you balance it with other things like uh, weapons or locations? You no, know, not with Counter-Strike. We didn't, we didn't really balance it with weapons because we made the weapons kind of like you, you buy them at the start of the round. And uh, pretty much each team had pretty much the same uh, kind of weapon types. So we didn't really want to mess with the weapons so much. We tried to just balance it with, good, uh, with proper level design. I think that's, that's the only thing that we really did with balancing it. Just try to have the locations of the hostages in, in proper spots that would make it kind of balanced. So as you uh, as you probably played a lot of the Counter-Strike maps, a lot of the maps there, they, they don't look realistic. Like you, when you look at the layout, you don't think, oh, this is not something that makes sense in a realistic setting. But they're, they were kind of set up that way because they were balanced, you know. So yeah. OK, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Hi. Um, I have two questions. Um, one, the first one is, 
if there will be another Counter-Strike sequel. And the other one is uh, if you're thinking in creating another game. Um, yeah, as regards to the Counter-Strike sequel, uh, I don't work at Valve anymore, so I, I left in 2006. So uh, I think, I don't really know what their plans are with regards to a sequel, because uh, I look at CSGO right now and I think, wow, that's, you know, uh, that's a really great game. I don't know how they can improve on that. So uh, I have no idea if they plan on doing a sequel. Uh, myself, personally, I uh, I tried to make a game after Counter-Strike, but it wasn't very good, and I'm not going to mention it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but now I'm just working on another game. Uh, I'm working on a game called Rust, and uh, I'm really enjoying it. So, it, it's a lot different than Counter-Strike. So, uh, yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. Hey, I'm here. Oh, uh, hello. Uh, I was just wondering your comments about uh, with 100 games releasing every day, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's a really sustainable um, thing that, uh, so it's going to break, uh, it's going to yeah. pop some, yeah. and I was uh, wondering what your thoughts are about that, because you seem really inform, informed yeah. on the industry. Yeah, uh, it's a really good point. I, I always... I always look at it and people ask me, oh, how do I get in the industry? And I'm, I'm like, uh, you shouldn't really get in this. It's a difficult industry. I mean, it's scary because 10 years ago, it was very, you know, it was a very attractive industry to get into, but now it's become quite saturated and, and difficult for, for new gamer, game developers to really make a mark on it. Uh, you know, do, uh, so the question was, uh, uh, what do I see? It's gonna blow up, right? Um, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think we're going to start to see uh, maybe a, a point where we're not going to see as many game developers. They're going to realize they can't make money doing this, and they're going to probably try to, you know, kind of move to different industries. So I don't think it's going to constantly increase. You're like, we're not going to see a million games every day. No, I do think, like, because here's the thing. You know, out of all those 100 games that release uh, every day, only one of them makes money. You know, the other 99 guys, the, you know, they're poor. Yeah. <laughs> It's sad, but it's true, you know, because I'm one of those 99. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here you go. Hi. Hello. Um, so, recent controversy about DLC. Uh, you yes. <laughs> what's your opinion? Ooh. Yeah, you know, to me, it seems like DLC is kind of like, almost like free to play, you know? They're trying to make more money on a, a product that they already sold, so, uh, yeah, I mean, like, I'm not a big fan of it per se, but I look at it as, you know, these game developers, these game publishers, they become so large, they become, it takes so much money to develop these games that they have to make their money back. And, they, and they, they're looking at these methods, and DLC is one of them where they can, you know, make more money on a product that they already made and you know, uh, it's just yeah. It's to me, it looks like kind of like an extension of free to play, where where they're trying to sell more stuff in the game that you know it's already been sold. So yeah, I mean, I, me personally, I, I can't say that I'm a big fan of it as a gamer, but I mean, as a developer, I kind of understand where they're coming from because uh, it does cost a lot of money to make those games. Yeah, unfortunately, um, especially with these big AAA games. I mean, it costs like. Uh, I was looking at the, the, the budget for uh, GTA 5, and I think it was like $500 million or something. You know, it's ridiculous. But it made like billions, so I mean, in the, in the end it worked out. Uh, but some games like, you know, that do resort to selling DLCs, they cost around maybe $100 million, And, you know, if they don't sell the DLCs, they, 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 don't, make, they don't make back the money that they, they spent. So it, it's kind of, uh, it's unfortunate that they resort to those tactics, but... Um, I mean, you see, I, I don't think it's going to go away, though, because you start, like, you look at Call of Duty, you look at Battlefield, all of them have DLCs, all of them have the season pass stuff. And, yeah, I, I think it's really just kind of like their version of free-to-play, you know. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry, yeah. Hopefully uh, that answers uh, your question. Over here. Uh, up here, up here. Upper, upper. More. At the top, at the top, at the top. Uh, here. Oh, hello. Hi. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have two quick questions. The first one is slightly answered. 
you said in the middle of the presentation that you think realistic games can't really have cosmetic effects, but yeah. recently CSGO introduced weapon skins. Yeah. So yeah. that kind of contradicted. Yeah, you know, I mean, and I don't, you know, me personally, I think it looks kind of weird, the weapon skins, because it kind of turns the game into like a circus. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the thing is, Yeah, uh, but I, when you, I, I don't think Valve really had a choice with CS because there was nothing that they can change other than the, the guns. So, so yeah, that's why I do feel like if you're gonna make your game on reality, you really, you're really limiting yourself. And and I think Valve ag agreed with me and they said, oh my God, what do we, we have to do something. So, I think skins was probably the, the 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 probably the easiest thing they can change without making everybody mad. I mean, can you imagine if they change the player skins? Oh man, I mean, like you would see a lot of flack. I mean, I wouldn't want to play the game because you know, for me, playing a realistic game is about. Uh, it, trying to put me into the, the world and trying to convince me that I'm in that setting. And when someone's running around with a pink hat, it, it just destroys the setting, right? So, uh, so yeah, that's kind of why I don't think realistic games fit that well, because they kind of break the, the rea reality. They break the, the immersion factor, so, yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, with regards to the question, do I like the, 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 the gun skins? No, I don't, I don't like it. Yeah. And the other question, are you in the PC master race or you're a console fan? <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm definitely PC master race because I'm a developer. So. <laughs> so, so guys, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Min. Yeah, thank you, so, guys. Yeah, thank you. I think he deserves it. So. Give it on. So we're, we're going to have also two workshops next. One big data and another one by me, Unity. Uh, and he'll also be at the showcase. So thank you, everyone. Pleasure to have you here. See you tomorrow. Yes, yes, sure, sure. Okay, are you?